Hello and welcome to our glaucoma surgical lecture series. And today's topic is Express Mini Miniature Shunt. Um, I am Ramesh, Dr. Ramesh Ayala from Tulane School of Medicine, New Orleans, Louisiana. This um, presentation is brought to you by Meditrad, a leader in online training and education. Here are my financial disclosures. Specifically, I have nothing to declare in regards to Express Shunt. I've never been a consultant in, um, to this device or any of the companies that marketed Express Shunt. I do receive some educational grant support from Alcon, uh, which markets Express Shunt. But having said that, I've never directly been consulted in regards to Express, just so it's out there. So what is Express Miniature Shunt? It's a device developed by Dr. Balkin from Tel Aviv, Israel in 1997. Got its FDA approval in 2003. It's a 27 gauge um, uh, size device uh, that measures 400 microns externally, 50 microns internally, and uh, 2.96 millimeters long. It's made of this special stainless steel material that is MRI safe. Um, you know, repeat again, it's MRI safe. A frequently asked question by radiologists when their patients tell them that they had expression for glaucoma treatment. Um, uh, so those of you who are listening to this conversation can tell your radiologist that it's extremely safe to use uh, and it's MRI safe. Um, so the Express does come in uh, two um, uh, uh, shapes, uh, uh, two models. Uh, the, uh, we'll go through the models, but the basic uh, device structure is the same. Um, it has a faceplate, which uh, prevents uh, device um, intrusion. Um, and this uh, faceplate is what sits on this little bed. And the, it has a spur that prevents the device extrusion out of the eye uh, through the sclera. And uh, there's a bevel tip that uh, enables optimal insertion with minimal damage to the tissue as you're implanting the device. And it has a relief port um, that allows uninterrupted aqueous humor flow. Um, the um, uh, the uh, the shaft, as I mentioned, is 27 gauge or 0.4 millimeter outer diameter, and the inner um, lumen it measures approximately 50 microns. And the distance between the skeletal spur and the um, and the faceplate is meant to accommodate the human skeletal thickness, which at the limbus measures uh, 0 0.72 to 0 0.75 millimeters. There is a vertical channel in one, one of these models to allow aqueous, optimal aqueous flow posteriorly. So there are the two models that are currently out there, the R50 and the P50. The, the main difference between the two is a bevel. Um, uh, this is a, a decreased bevel angle in the P50 model compared to the R50 model. And in the P50 model, there's a vertical wedge or um, uh, in the face plate to allow the aqueous posterior direction, um, to allow the aqueous to flow posteriorly. So apart from that, uh, these two devices are very similar um, in outlook and in their performance and in the long-term surgical success rate. The Express uh, does uh, come um, uh, preloaded from the company. Um, it's uh, preloaded onto this uh, Express delivery system or the EDS. The EDS uh, comes uh, with a uh, uh, with a, a spring-like mechanism. And um, if you watch the surgeon here, he's, trying, he's pressing on the spring right in the middle of it. And uh, once you press it all the way down, um, it's going to release the express at the, at the tip of the device. So what are the indications for expression? They're similar to a trabeculectomy procedure. Uh, any patient with open angles and uh, deep chambers, um, they're fit for, and of course, elevated intraocular pressure, so they're poorly controlled with uh, glaucoma medications. They're all uh, good for express shunt. Uh, combined cataract glaucoma surgery, open angle glaucoma, AFAK glaucoma, glaucoma falling, detached uh, retinal detachment surgery, traumatic glaucoma, uveated glaucoma. Um, so most glaucomas that have open angles and deep chambers, they're um, they're all uh, good indications for expression as long as the intraocular pressure is poorly controlled. Um, so some basic rules before we go step by step into the expression um, uh, implantation techniques. Um, uh, initially, expression was uh, marketed as a five-minute subcontactable implantation technique. 
um, and has uh, been uh, rapidly um, uh, uh, abandoned. Uh, and, and the reason for that is a lot of these ice ended up with uh, conjectival erosion um, and, uh, and the device exclusion and also um, because of uh, hypotony and hypotony related complications. So it's not recommended to you implant the device in the subconjectival uh, tissue. Uh, so later on, um, we modified the device implantation technique to go under the scleroplast, just like what we do with trabecular, standard trabecular procedure. And the needle size that we use to implant it is 27 gauge needle to have a tight fit. We do use metamycin just like in the trabeculectomy to decrease the postoperative fibrosis. There is an option for the surgeon to use viscoelastic in the anterior chamber in the immediate postoperative uh, in the, soon after the, uh, the implantation or before the implantation. Reason uh, for that will be discussed in a little while. And uh, you always want to make sure that the insertion is at the scleral end of the limbus and not through placorne. And I'll show you some examples what happens if you implant the express improperly through cornea. Know your anatomy before you do any glaucoma surgery. Uh, for that matter, any kind of uh, surgery that you want to do, you should know your anatomy. Okay. In relation to the expression, um, here is the anatomy, relevant anatomy that you need to be aware of. Um, this is what you're looking at. Okay, here is a sclera. Um, you as a surgeon, or you, you're looking down through the microscope in this direction. You can see the sclera, you can see the scleral limbal junction right here. You can see the corneal limbal junction right here, and this is the cornea. And when you go past the scleral limbal junction, which is where the scleral spur is, you will start looking into the blue zone. Okay, so the ideal, and this is a, this is a schematic, and uh, this is the, um, Real view that I obtained a picture that uh, from Ike um, Ahmed um, uh, um, from the internet, and it's a great picture, and that's why I like to show it to you. Here is cornea, which is where we are here. Um, okay, cornea. You have the blue zone that I'm talking about. Um, you have the scleral spur, um, and you have the sclera, right? And the implantation has to be just anterior to the scleral spur, okay? You don't want to do the implantation here. This is wrong, okay? This is wrong. So you want the correct site is right about there. Remember this when you do the surgery and the surgical techniques um, and the surgical results will be much better. Um, and when you implant, when you make your entry right about here, uh, imagine you're going through the trabecular mesh work in this direction, and you want the needle to be parallel to the iris plane, parallel to the iris plane. So you don't want to enter like this. This is wrong, okay? You want this to be parallel to the iris plane somewhat like this. And the reason for that is you want it away from the cornea at the same time, you don't want to embed the device into the iris. Okay, here are some uh, pictures from uh, patients. Um, uh, so you know, with any surgical uh, technique that, that you do in terms of glaucoma surgery, I like to use the preservative-free lidocaine mixed with epinephrine. Uh, we stopped doing retrovalvular injections for, a lot of the, uh, for all of these glaucoma procedures. Uh, but I will leave it up to the surgeon, individual surgeon, to find their comfort zone. Um, uh, um, uh, uh, one critical step the, is to get adequate exposure of the surgical site, which is uh, the 12 o'clock limbal area, which is my preferred site. Um, so we use a um, clay corneal limbal traction suture. I typically use a 7 uh, traction suture to pull the eye down to get adequate exposure of the superior limbal uh, conjunctiva. Following this, uh, we make a little pyramid in this area we, uh, and inject the mixture of lidocaine, preservative-free lidocaine, mixed with uh, epinephrine. The lidocaine portion of this will give you the anesthesia that is needed. The epinephrine will hopefully blanch the blood vessels and control the bleeding. And the, it's, it's a great um, uh, combination. You can use this for all kinds of glaucoma procedures and also to help you in your cataract surgeries or difficult cataract surgeries, cataract surgeries. If the pupil is small, this, uh, this 
this uh, solution will guide the pupil for you. If you have to do intraocular manipulations, uh, this will provide you both anesthesia and uh, But once we we inject that, um, this area of the conjunctiva will be anesthetized, and also the solution will dilate it for you. Finish the rest of the dissection with the vescular with the Vescart scissors, and uh, this is followed by a scleral flap dissection. Um, the thickness of the scleral flap ideally should be about 50%. Um, uh, you don't want the scleral flap to be too thin, or else the express plate, uh, the face plate, can erode through that scleral flap. Um, so make sure that the scleral flap is at least 50% um, uh, uh, in thickness. And identify, as you complete the, the dissection, identify your anatomy. You want to identify the scleral spur, and you want to identify the Schwalbe's line, and you want to identify the cornea, which is here. The sclera is here, and the, this junction here. This anatomy I'll be going through over and over again with every glaucoma procedure that we're going to demonstrate here. So know your anatomy, extremely important for you to know this. Um, once you identify this, the critical point that I want to drive home is just anterior to the scleral spur is where you want to make your entry. Okay. Once the scleral flap dissection is done, then you want to do your uh, mitomycin sponge uh, implantation technique to decrease the postoperative fibrosis. Um, uh, you can you can apply mitomycin one of two ways, either in a sponge form. That's uh, um, I use a standard Wexel sponge uh, cut in tiny pieces and soaked in 0.4. Let me write this down here. It's 0.4 milligrams per cc concentration is what I like to use. Um, standardize your dosage of metamycin, whatever you feel comfortable. I've been using this same dosage for the last 15, 16 years now. And so I know what to expect from this dosage. And so I vary the time. Now, depending upon the conjunctival uh, and the tenons thickness and other um, uh, conditions of the patient, such as uh, uh, the age of the patient and, uh, and the previous uh, history as to what happened to the other eye if we already operated on the other eye. Um, so based on those situations, I vary the time, the duration of exposure, but the, the, uh, the concentration, um, I try and keep it constant, okay? So more recently, people are injecting um, so, um, the mitomycin 0.1 cc of it into the subconjunctal area approximately half an hour to one hour prior to surgery. Uh, and then they would do the dissection just like what we're doing. Um, if you if you're using the sponges, make sure that you count the number of sponges that are going in. The idea here is to place one sponge on, in, on either side of the superior rectus, um, as I'm showing here. And one sponge under the scleral flap, I leave it for on an average about 40 seconds, I remove the sponge, make sure that you get all three sponge pieces and no leftover pieces or left behind. Um, and, and then you want to take a dry Vexel sponge and remove all the excess mitomycin there before you flush it with a little bit of BSS to clean that area. At this stage, you're ready to um, enter the entry chamber with a 27 gauge needle. And as I explained to you, the entry point is in the gray zone, um, which is just anterior to the scleral spur and parallel to the iris plane. So make sure that, uh, that the entry, um, the needle uh, track is parallel to the iris plane and uh, that you can clearly see the needle in the anterior chamber. And once you withdraw here, you can you can actually see the uh, the needle in the anterior chamber, and uh, and I hold this little uh, this little flap with a 0.12 forceps as I do this. Um, and it's ever so easy technique. Um, one thing that you got to be careful um, with the, some of my residents observe this. They make this little flap so thin and flimsily attached to the limbus that um, and they're so tense as they enter the anterior chamber with the needle that they pull too much on this little flap and actually pull it off. And I've seen that happen in some of my residents' hands. So you gotta be careful. One, um, a, uh, one make sure that the scleral flap is 50% depth and the dissection is properly done. Is look at the bed. The bed does not have any uneven uh, surface indicating that the dissection has been perfectly done. And two, uh, make sure that, that it's firmly adherent to the limbal area. Three, 
there is absolutely no need for you to exert too much tension on this little flap. All you want is this little flap to be held away from the insert, insertion site so as to get good visibility. And then you enter the antechamber with the needle, making sure that the needle is lying parallel to the iris plane, as you can see, but away from the cornea too. And then you bring in the express um, that's preloaded through um, uh, using the express uh, uh, EDS system that uh, the the company provides. And uh, make sure that the nurse who is handing it over to you just peels off the uh, the case, and uh, you take the express out yourself. Um, sometimes, unless the nurse who is um, um, who is working with you has been working with you for a long period of time and she is well aware of how to handle this uh, device as she hands it over to you. Once it's in your hand, um, make sure that you hold this little flap again, just like um, um, I'm showing you in this picture with 0.12 forceps, and then insert the, the expression through the needle track and use gentle to and fro motions to, uh, to, um, to uh, kind of imp uh, implant it all the way to the, uh, the face plate. And then let go by depressing on the EDS system. So here it is nicely um, um, inserted with the, uh, with the plate flush with the sclera. At this point, it's ready to be released. Now you release it. Once it's released, you can see it's sitting nice, flush against the scleral bed. Um, and you want to check and make sure that aqueous is coming out of it. Um, now here is the full, uh, EDS system that I'm talking about, and here is where you got to depress. You got to depress in this area here, um, um, and, and make sure that you depress it all the way down for the express to be released in this area. Once it's done, once the express is uh, properly implanted, you can uh, check for free flow of aqueous. So here's a vexal sponge that is um, wet, indicating a nice flow of the aqueous. Um, and at this stage, you know, it's uh, you close the, uh, this little flap with two interrupted tenonylon sutures, and I'll show you a full-length video of this at the end of this presentation. Um, and then close the conjunctiva with the, whatever technique that you're comfortable with. I like to use to um, uh, what I call is a wing suture, so on either side um, of the, you know, on either end, and then a matter stitch in the middle. And you can see a nice blub in this, uh, in this situation uh, with the express properly implanted, wide chamber, form chamber. Um, so the advantages of expression compared to trabeculectomy, it's easy insertion. Um, it, uh, you don't need to do an aerodactomy procedure. No scleral flap, uh, scleral tissue is removed. Um, no, it has some predictable outflow uh, because uh, of the standardized uh, um, size of the implant. AC is quieter and, and formed in majority of these patients compared to trabeculectomy. Um, it has reduced inflammation because you're not cutting the iris. Um, and the, the, the uh, you may be able to uh, get a more posterior diffuse blab morphology with the uh, posterior direction of the aqueous. Um, the disadvantages, flat chambers and coral effusions, if you choose to you know, implant in the subconjunctival uh, tissue, which nobody is doing to my knowledge at this point, uh, but even following the proper implantation under the scleral flap, uh, shunt erosion through the scleral flap and the conjunctiva are un not uncommon. We do still see it, and that can expose the patient to potential infections. Um, the shunt migration into the anterior chamber is rare, but I have seen um, myself uh, several cases of this because of it's not a, prob a fault of the device, but it's more of a surgeon's uh, problem here uh, when they implant the device in an imp imp improperly in cornea, that's when you see the shunt migration um, or improper dissection, wherein you leave extremely thin uh, sclera corneal junction um, uh, and implant it into like a decimate window situation. Of course, the shunt is going to migrate into the antechamber, and that's what has happened uh, in the cases that I've seen. So it's not a device problem here. It's more of a surgical, poor surgical technique, uh, I should say. 
blood failure from fibrosis, which is very similar to that of trabeculectomy. Um, and then added cost of the implant of uh, $700. Um, so we actually we are the first ones to have reported the complications of expression way back in 2005. Um, here are some examples of anterior migration of the exploitation with the localized corneal decomposition, as you can see. Again, like I, like I said before, this is not a problem with the implant. The, if the implant is properly used, you should never see this. This clearly is a surgical problem created by the surgeon by improperly positioning it in cornea. You should never implant these devices in the cornea. Here is a case with uh, uh, subconjectival erosion. It has eroded actually through the, this little flap of the conjectiva, and this can happen. And when you do see that, you got to take it out, and I'll show you, uh, I'll demonstrate to you um, how to take this out. Uh, but um, watch out for this. And here's another case where it has worked itself from the side of the scleral flap and kind of uh, exposed itself by cutting through the conjectiva gain um, has to be taken out. Here is a case um, uh, that had uh, um, erosion and exposure of the of the conjecta of the of the device um, and has resulted in endophthalmitis unfortunately the patient lost his eye. So here is, uh, if you do see this um, um, erosion and exposure of the device faceplate, um, here are a couple of uh, techniques um, for removal. Um, you can either do it for using the external approach or you can do it using the internal approach. The external approach is, um, uh, is as follows. You have to do a conjectival dissection in the adjacent area, like we did here, exposing the, the plate. And then using a 15 degree blade, you make a cut on either side of the, the implant, um, and then you got to twist. Um, uh, you got to twist the implant to um, make the spur parallel to the in, um, to the incision, and then you pull it out. That's the key. You got to you got to make sure that the spur is twisted and is parallel to the uh, to the incision and then you can take it out. The other way around you can do this is uh, through the internal approach that we have done a few cases in the last year or so. Um, here, is the, here is the device. You can see it internally on gonio view. Um, you can make a paracentesis um, uh, in the opposite nimble area um, and using a MVR blade or uh, um, and enter the anterior chamber using the MVR blade, um, bent MVR blade, a one millimeter blade. And then what you want to do is to make incisions on either side from within um, to loosen up the, the, the device. And the, the length of this incision has to be slightly bigger than the face plate. Once you achieve that, you can go in with your micro forceps, grab the device, and it, you, you know, it's pretty easy to dislodge it into the anterior chamber. Of course, you want to do it under the cover of viscoelastic, and, uh, and then you can take it out successfully. So now let's look at the published results. Um, it has equal efficacy as a trabeculectomy at 12 and 24 months. Uh, so evidence to suggest that early postoperative course is more stable um, with expression uh, but is not been proven. Um, some ardent believers of expression to swear by it, and they suggest that the post early postoperative course is much easier, less inflammatory, uh, and more stable compared to trabeculectomy operation. The incidence of coral effusions are significantly less uh, compared to exp uh, with expression compared to trabeculectomy in uh, some of these studies. So the, the last major paper that came out of it comparing a two years, um, uh, two-year comparison of Express uh, versus uh, trabeculectomy shunt, uh, versus trabeculectomy by Peter Netherland and, and, uh, and, uh, and his group um, was published in uh, 2014, that's this year in AJO. 
um, and it's called the XVT study. Um, as you can see, the IOP at two years was 14.7 plus or minus 4.6 in the express group with 83% success rate compared to 14.6 plus or minus 7.1 in the triple group with the 79% P being at 0 0.9. So the conclusions of this study were um, that the mean IOP, visual equity, surgical success were similar between the two groups. So they did not find any statistically significant difference between the two groups. And they concluded that Express is as, as, as safe as a trabeculectomy operation. Okay, so there were um, in the AGS, um, uh, or the American Glaucoma Society meeting um, that was held in February, they were two presentations that I thought were interesting, and so I'm quoting those presentations here. Both the studies looked at the outcomes between express versus trabeculectomy at three years. Okay, now these two studies, I caution you, have been presented in a meeting, but have not been published yet. And so, as you all know, um, there is a difference between presentation in a meeting versus actually going through peer review publication process. Uh, and so at this point, these, uh, these, uh, you have to assume that this is clean data that they presented, but both the studies concluded that express glaucoma filtration device provides little additional long-term benefit over conventional trabeculectomy. And in one study, uh, they compared the cost analysis and they suggested that Express is not a cost-effective alternative to trabeculectomy. So where does this um, device fit in my own practice? I use it in cases where I worry about flat chambers. So we, here in Southern Louisiana, we have significant obesity problems with advanced glaucoma. So if I have to do a, um, a, a filtration procedure in an obese patient where I'm worried about um, flat chambers, I like to use um, expression as part of a combination surgery. Uh, AFK glaucomas express does um, better in my hands compared to trabeculectomy. Um, and uh, when, I, when I do a lot of canal plastic procedures here when the canals fail, um, I sometimes, go to procedure of calling the failed canoplasty is an expression. But remember, there's an added cost of $700 to express, express procedure. We have a paper um, that was just published in Journal Glaucoma comparing the cost of express versus trabeculectomy. Um, the, and clearly, uh, express costs you about $800 more than trabeculectomy procedure. So in one sense, it can be called as a glorified trabeculectomy. Some of the opponents of expression call this as a glorified trap. Um, the proponents call it as a uh, safer trabeculectomy technique. It may have some early postoperative advantages. In the late postoperative period, definitely, there are no differences compared to trabeculectomy. So here are some of the key references that I referred to during my talk. And at this stage, um, 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 and so please, uh, uh, look forward to more lectures on Meditrade YouTube website and look out for our CME and board review courses. And uh, if you, should you have any comments, you can reach me at ilatmeditrade.com or rilatulane.edu. And um, please stand by as we go into the video section at this stage. Uh, let's have the video of expression implantation, please. Okay, um, here is a example of how I implant the express shunt. Uh, here is my lidocaine epinephrine injection uh, following the peritomy, and that will allow me to do the subconjunctival dissection. As you can see, this is followed by the scleral flap 2% depth dissection, um, and then note the placement of mitomycin C, um, one in each is um, a quadrant and then one into the scleral flap and generally leave it for approximately 45 seconds, like I mentioned, um, at the end of which we, we make sure that we get all the three uh, sponge pieces out of the eye. Um, and, and one other thing that I like to do with the mitomycin is to rub it into the sclera. Um, it, um, the scleral bed turns a little yellow when you do that. And I think it uh, gives me more effect, as you can see here. To I wipe out the excess of mitomycin stage, wash it, and 
here is image of the Windows 7 gig. You can see it's running Python 2.0. Uh, I explained uh, very nicely down at the good bar by Jack and Expert Shunt. Um, and you twist this gently, and then you release the, the Express once you make sure that it's in the empty chamber as it should be. Now you make sure that the, uh, it's, uh, the face plate is flush with this little bed, and, and that Windows is coming out. This little thing now let's go to the second video which will demonstrate uh, to you um, so this particular video will demonstrate how to remove the express externally as you can see here the contextable dissection is already performed um, and this is a, a Express that's extruded through the contactiva. Um, I'm taking a 50 degree blade and extending the insertion on the other side of the Windows on either side of the Express shunt. Um, there you go. Once once you have like a millimeter or so insertion full thickness in the chamber on either side, you twist the Express to uh, make the spur parallel to the incision and then it will come out very so easily. Once it's out, you can close this incision with the figure of eight suture and close the contactor. Okay. Let's go to the third video. In this uh, video, I'm going to demonstrate how to take the express from within. Um, here is an MVR blade. I inject some scholastic and anti-chamber under the gold. I'm using the MVR blade to cut on either side of the express shunt um, uh, and to loosen up the face plate uh, under the scleral flap, of course, and then I go with the micro forceps and deliver the express into the anti-chamber or it comes out ever so easily. Um, and once that's done, you have to enlarge the wound size Express to be brought out. So, in degree blade, the express shunt takes pretty easy, pretty elegant technique. This um, is uh, like this, it saves the, um, the section of the contactiva, um, and it's a great technique. That concludes our presentation on express shunt. Thank you very much.